inside a conference room. In the material below, the actions are happening in two women. The first one, without glasses, dressed in a white blouse and black trousers, has black imitation leather or leather pumps on a small pin set on bare feet. With her, only the right leg put on the left sometimes protrudes the back of the shoe from the heel. The second one, wearing glasses, wearing a navy blue coat, trousers of the same color and beige patent pumps with a bow on a very small stiletto heel. They are also placed on feet without any socks. There is much more going on here, the woman takes off her shoes in various positions. There is much more magma beneath Yellowstone than previously thought. As we know, Yellowstone is not only a beautiful and vast American national park. Underneath this area is also the caldera of one of the largest supervolcanoes on Earth. The eruption of which would have catastrophic consequences for the entire globe. In this context, Knowing the exact amount of magma stored beneath Yellowstone is crucial. Supervolcanoes are defined as volcanoes that have had at least one eruption of magnitude 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. This is the highest position in the indicated index and is attributed to the largest volcanic eruptions in history. This means that the explosion released more than 1,000 cubic kilometers of pyroclastic material, and the height of the ash cloud ejected into the atmosphere exceeded 25 kilometers. The Yellowstone supervolcano had the largest number of such explosions. Scientists know five such eruptions of the American supervolcano, and the last one took place about 640,000 years ago. Years ago, Yellowstone is not a peaceful place. Scientists are constantly recording earthquakes there. They are not strong, but when activity in the area of the volcano's caldera increases, there can be hundreds of them in a week. More disturbing information about the supervolcano has recently surfaced. Scientists have shown that there is up to twice as much magma beneath Yellowstone as previously thought. Does this mean the volcano is about to erupt? This is not known. Predicting an eruption is extremely difficult. However, if a supervolcano were to erupt, the effects would be catastrophic. But scientists reassure and say that there is no reason to worry. Determining how much magma has accumulated beneath Yellowstone is important because it may, in part, determine how imminent an eruption of this supervolcano is. By the way, it is quite often said in its context that, in terms of cyclicity and the frequency with which its eruptions occur, this volcano is a bit late. But how can you determine exactly how much magma is there? One of the imaging methods that can be used is the so-called seismic tomography. It uses ground vibrations, or seismic waves, to create a three-dimensional image of what is happening beneath the Earth's surface. Using this method, Ross McGuire, now employed as an assistant at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, was able to image a network of magma chambers that also revealed the location of the magma itself. However, these images were not accurate. An even better method was needed. Maguire consulted his results with Min Chen, a late expert in a type of computational seismic tomography called waveform tomography. The combination of her abilities and the images he obtained brought the expected results. By joining forces, scientists have been able to better model how seismic waves propagate. Thanks to this, it was also possible to significantly improve the quality of results obtained by Maguire. In this way, we learned much more about the magma accumulated under Yellowstone. What is important here is the summary of this issue by the aforementioned researcher himself, who stated that he did not so much see the increase in the level of magma, 
but rather see more clearly what was already there. The magma chamber contains a mixture of molten rocks and crystalline structures. The more molten rock there is, the greater the risk of an eruption. Previous research had indicated that the magma in the chamber is about 10%. Improved imaging made it possible to see that there is actually twice as much magma there, from 16 to 20%. Earlier estimates put about 900 cubic kilometers of magma in the reservoir. The new ones indicate 1,600 cubic kilometers or even more. Ross McGuire, however, reassures that this does not mean that an eruption may occur in the near future. He emphasizes that the network of geophysical instruments that constantly monitor the activity of the supervolcano under Yellowstone will certainly warn us about this. Scientists estimate that an eruption may occur when the rocks in the chamber are 35 to 50 percent melted. Our ancestors have been wearing bear skins for 320,000 years. Years ago, according to research by German archaeologists, our ancestors are already 320,000 years old. Years ago, they hunted cave bears to obtain their skins, which served them as clothing. This is evidenced by the precise cuts on the bones found in one of the caves in Germany. New research shows that our ancestors in Northern Europe were able to survive harsh winter conditions thanks in part to warm bear skins. As we know, our prehistoric ancestors hunted various species of animals. However, not always the main reason for this was the desire to obtain and eat their meat. Bears can serve as an example here. Because our ancestors cared much more about their fur, the bear's winter coat consists of both long outer hairs, which create an airy protective layer, and short, dense hairs, which provide particularly good insulation. According to German scientists, their skins allowed our ancestors to survive in the cold and harsh conditions of northwestern Europe in the Middle Pleistocene. We all probably agree that moving without any cover in winter on our continent, to put it mildly, would not be a very wise idea. Probably our people living 320,000 years ago were of the same opinion. Ancestors years ago. Scientists say they have found evidence that they used the fur and skin of hunted bears to protect themselves from the cold. One such evidence is noteworthy. Well, at the archaeological site of Schoningen in Germany, dating back to the Stone Age, traces of cuts were noticed in the vicinity of the pools of bear remains found there. Interestingly, Similar evidence has also been found elsewhere in Europe, but the ones from Germany are by far the oldest, dating back approximately 320,000 years ago. Years. The site in Schoningen is also unique for another reason. It is here that the oldest spears discovered by archaeologists were found. So it is extremely important in the context of research on hunting animals by pre-humans. The cut marks mentioned above usually prove that people obtained meat from a given animal. However, as the researchers point out, this part of the bear's body, the paws, cannot be cut out in too large quantities. Therefore, it is more reasonable to believe that the purpose of such action was rather to obtain skin. In addition, it must also be borne in mind that the skin of an animal can be used as a cover only if it is removed within a day from the moment of its hunting. After that time it just starts to deteriorate. So our ancestors couldn't just look around for dead animals, because their skins were simply useless to them. An additional proof that the animals found in Schoningen were hunted is the fact that only bones and teeth of adult bears were found at this site. At the site in Schoningen, various types of tools were also found, 
the use of which was usually associated with the preparation of animal skins, such as scrapers. And this, in turn, further strengthens the hypothesis that bears were hunted for their skins hundreds of thousands of years ago. Subcutaneous fat is important for women's brain health. The anatomical and physiological differences between men and women are obvious. However, their importance for the body continues to surprise us. It turns out that the fat tissue that accumulates in different places in women can be important for the health of their brain. Women are more likely to deposit subcutaneous fat in areas such as the hips, buttocks, and backs of the arms. On the other hand, men are more likely to visceral obesity. But according to a recent study, the accumulation of subcutaneous fat in women may protect against encephalitis, which can lead to problems such as dementia and stroke. As we know, in women, adipose tissue is rather subcutaneous and accumulates on their hips, buttocks and arms, while in men, most of it accumulates in the abdominal cavity, taking the form of the so-called visceral obesity. The latter is much more pro-inflammatory. It is also men who are at greater risk, at least before menopause in women, for related health problems, such as heart attack or stroke. However, is it due to the location of adipose tissue? Usually, the issues of such differences are related to the hormonal balance and estrogen. But it is worth looking at this issue from a broader perspective. Some studies that may shed new light on this matter have been conducted on mice, which appear to be similar to humans in some respects. This similarity consists, for example, in the fact that female mice also have subcutaneous adipose tissue to a greater extent than males and that located in the abdominal cavity to a lesser extent. However, it was decided to investigate what effect this may have on inflammation that could threaten the brain. First of all, by studying mice whose diet was high in fat, the researchers noticed that until the females entered menopause, they did not show any inflammation in the brain or insulin resistance which in turn can lead to diabetes. Around 48 weeks thereafter, the distribution of body fat in females began to more closely resemble that observed in males. Then it was decided to undergo a liposuction-like procedure for the females to remove subcutaneous fat. The hormonal balance of the mice was not interfered with in any way. The result was surprising. As these females began to see increased levels of inflammation in the brain, in a manner comparable to that of males. At the same time, their levels of visceral obesity increased. As if the fat had been redirected there. However, the results in mice on a low-fat diet were dramatically different. In their case, the removal of subcutaneous fat early in life resulted in only a slight increase in abdominal fat. However, there was no significant effect on the health of their brains. It is worth noting that Alexis M. Stranahan from the Medical College at Augusta University, who has been conducting research in this respect for years, noticed that in males, Visceral obesity is pro-inflammatory in relation to the brain, while subcutaneous tissue transplantation contributes to reducing this risk. So this is another area where women probably have an advantage over men. The world's first sand battery is an answer to energy challenges energy production, its transmission, storage, these and other challenges are increasingly keeping the energy sector awake at night in the modern world. In addition, it is increasingly important that the energy obtained is green. Ecological energy. Researchers in Finland seem to have come up with an idea that addresses all these challenges at once. 
Finnish scientists have built the world's first fully functioning sand battery that can store energy for months. The idea is simple. Storing heat in the sand to keep homes warm during the winter. Certainly. One of the reasons why Finland undertakes various innovative initiatives in the energy sector is Russia's reaction to that country's declaration of its willingness to join NATO. As a result, Russia stopped electricity supplies to Finland. The country will therefore have to take action to ensure that its citizens have enough warmth and light. Perhaps ordinary sand will come to the rescue of Finland. In one of the power plants in the west of the country, in Kankanha, about 230 kilometers northwest of Helsinki, the first sand battery was installed. Its construction is very simple. It is about 100 tons of construction sand locked in an insulated silo. Why sand? This solution has only advantages. Of course. This material is cheap. It is able to store thermal energy, because it can be heated up to a temperature of about 500 degrees Celsius. Equally important, the energy stored in this way can be stored for months. The possible application suggests itself, for example, heating homes in the winter. When electricity prices are higher, this solution actually gives you the opportunity to save specific money. If we add to this the fact that energy obtained from renewable sources, such as solar panels or wind turbines, could be stored in this way, sand batteries begin to appear as an ideal solution. It is the storage of energy obtained in this way that causes quite a lot of problems. However, the possibilities of using sand go far beyond using it as a reservoir for thermal energy. Advanced research in this direction has been conducted for years. Among others by U.S. National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL. These studies are conducted towards the possibility of using sand as a battery for green energy. But could such batteries start to compete with traditional lithium batteries? Research is also being conducted in this regard. For example, a group of scientists managed to create a battery that is able to work up to three times longer than a lithium battery. And nowadays, most batteries are made of lithium and are expensive. Take up a lot of space and can only handle a limited amount of excess energy. In the case of a sand battery, it will be different. Sand can provide a simple, cost-effective way to store energy. Every time there is a surplus of available electricity, we want to be able to bring it into our storage very quickly, says Marku Ulanen, co-author of the project and one of the founders of Polar Night Energy. The device was installed at Batajinkowski Power Station, which manages the district heating network for the area. The assumptions of Polar Night Energy look something like this. In the summer months, when energy is cheaper, the sand in the battery is to be heated with hot air to 500 degrees Celsius. Sand is a very effective medium for storing heat and loses little over time. The authors of the invention claim that their device can keep sand at a temperature of 500 degrees Celsius for several months. In winter, when energy prices are higher, the battery gives off heat, which is used to heat water to the heating network and then pumped to homes or offices. Unfortunately, converting heat into electricity is not very efficient, but long-term storage of energy in the form of heat is also a great opportunity for industry. Where the heat needed for the production of pharmaceuticals or textiles is obtained from burning fossil fuels. So far, the Finns have a working commercial system that is doing well at the moment. We have to wait to see what it will look like in the future. Scientists suggest that ancient bacteria may still be lurking beneath the Martian surface. In new experiments, 
Scientists simulated the Martian environment to see how long dried and frozen bacteria could survive in these harsh conditions. It turned out that ancient microbes would have been able to survive below the surface of Mars for much longer than previously thought. Buried microbes would be shielded from cosmic rays and the solar wind. This means that evidence of life may still be dormant and buried beneath the Martian surface. In research led by Professor Michael Daly was attended by Brian Hoffman and A.J. Sharma of Northwestern University. Their findings suggest that if life ever evolved on Mars, its biological remains could be revealed in future missions, including ExoMars and the Mars Life Explorer. In this second mission, the rover would be equipped with drills to extract materials from a depth of up to 2 meters below the planet's surface. Previously, scientists had proven that certain strains of bacteria could survive on Mars despite the planet's harsh environment. Thus, there is a risk that future astronauts and space tourists could inadvertently contaminate Mars with terrestrial bacteria. We concluded that terrestrial contamination on Mars would be essentially permanent, over time periods extending to thousands of years, says Hoffman. This could complicate scientific efforts to find life on Mars. In turn, if microbes evolved on Mars, they may be able to survive to this day. This means that samples from the red planet can contaminate the Earth, he explains. The environment on Mars is harsh and unforgiving. It is dry and frosty, with temperatures reaching as low as minus 63 degrees Celsius in mid-latitudes. Mars is also constantly bombarded by cosmic rays to investigate whether life could survive under these conditions. Daily, Hoffman and their colleagues first set the limits of survival of microorganisms under ionizing radiation. They then exposed six types of terrestrial bacteria and fungi to a simulated Martian surface, frozen and dry, and exposed them to radiation that mimicked cosmic rays. Researchers have determined that some terrestrial microorganisms could potentially survive on Mars on timescales of hundreds of millions of years. Scientists have found that one hardy microorganism, Deinococcus radiodurans, sometimes called the Conan bacteria, is particularly well suited to surviving the harsh conditions of Mars. In cutting-edge experiments, the bacterium survived massive doses of radiation in a freezing, sterile environment. The team also assumed that bacteria could be present beneath the Martian surface. To do this, he subjected the microbes to much lower doses of radiation than those found on the surface of the planet. It turned out that bacteria can withstand radiation and survive under the surface of the red planet for up to 1.5 million years buried at a depth of only 10 centimeters. If the bacteria were at a depth of 10 meters, the radiation would not harm them even for 280 million years. This means that if a microbe, similar to the Conan bacteria, Evolved when water was last flowing on Mars, its living remains may still be dormant deep below the Martian surface. While the radiodurans buried beneath the Martian surface could not survive dormant for the estimated 2 to 2.5 billion years since liquid water disappeared from the red planet. Martian environments are regularly altered by meteor impacts, explains Daly. We suggest that intermittent melting could allow intermittent repopulation. In addition, if Martian life ever existed, its macromolecules and viruses would have survived much, much longer, explains the scientist.